Hello kind people of YouTube and welcome back to another video. As always we have a bunch of stuff to get through today so let's get started with this first article from CCM. And here we have some statements from the CEO of Circle about where the crypto market is going in the future. The Bitcoin price will rocket over the next three years and cryptocurrency valuations will spike accordingly, says Jeremy Alea, the co-founder and CEO of Circle, a peer-to-peer -peer payments technology company backed by Goldman Sachs. While Alea was reticent to set a specific Bitcoin price target, he predicts that its value will unquestionably be a lot higher in three years than it is now. I don't make significant predictions, Alea told CNBC on December 14th, but it's certainly going to be worth a great deal more than it is today. I am long in the market. And can we just for a moment appreciate how refreshing it is that someone isn't just throwing out some random price numbers here as if he knew the future? Um, because so many people in the crypto world, and I, I talk about them all the time here, so if you've been following the channel, you know. So many people are just throwing out price predictions and um, usually it's not even clear what they're basing them on and they're just they're just acting as if the, that was a realistic view of the future like um, I know for a fact that in half a year Bitcoin will be worth $25,000 and uh, they just throw them out there and these people usually have to push back their price predictions like four separate times when it doesn't happen on the date where they said it would um, and their reasoning is always very vague. Like, um, I don't think just seeing, I don't think just seeing a good market sentiment and knowing that a few good things are going to happen, is enough to be able to get to an exact price. So it's so refreshing to say uh, to see someone here saying I don't make significant price predictions, and instead talking about the direction it is going because that is something that we can pretty reasonably do. <clears throat> When asked what will bring people who lost money in the current bear market back to the table, Alaire said it's because the fundamentals of cryptocurrencies haven't changed simply because their price is cratered. Regardless of its daily price, Alaire said Bitcoin has a very significant role to play as a non-sovereign store of value. I would personally extend that to cryptocurrency in general, not to Bitcoin in particular. And his quote. The key thing with Bitcoin is that it is unique in its security and its scale. As an idea that we need a scarce non-sovereign store of value that individuals can hold in a protected fashion, that's attractive all around the world. And like I said, if you extend that to crypto in general, I absolutely agree with him here. While naysayers have gleefully proclaimed the death of Bitcoin, Alaire said it would survive over the long haul and so will other cryptocurrencies. Alaire said some virtual currencies would die off in an overcrowded market due to competitive forces, but it's not a zero-sum game. Listen to this man, he's intelligent where the success of one digital currency means the death of all the others. It's always so nice um, because we, we get so much nonsense from people in the crypto world, from commentators, from investors, from leaders of certain cryptocurrencies, um, leaders of the development teams, leaders of the companies behind them. We get so much nonsense, but this is, um, this is a very no-nonsense take on where the future is. And I think it's very nice that he also points out that this is not a zero-sum game, which is what I've been saying for a while now, which most people seem to be realizing. Just yesterday we were talking about the CTO of Ripple also realizing this and talking about this. There is space for all of us. There is space for all of us in this world and we should be working together instead of against each other. But let's read a bit more of this article. It's very long. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But they talk about tokenization briefly. I do not think it's going to be a winner-take-all scenario, Alaire said. We have a phrase, the tokenization of everything. We think cryptographic tokens are going to represent every form of financial asset in the world. There will be millions of them in years. As CCN reported, Mike Novogratz, the founder of crypto investment bank Galaxy Digital, extolled the tokenization of real estate, saying asset tokenization is an emerging trend. Novogratz said several companies are tokening luxury condos in the uh, Tony real estate markets. I'm, I'm a bit confused by that sentence. It's probably something really obvious that I'm just, that's just going completely by me right now. But yeah, a um, lot of tokenized luxury condos in different markets like New York and Aspen. And I think we can read here because um, I just thought it was interesting to briefly note tokenization which is sometimes talked about in the crypto world, but isn't really one of the major topics that you hear about a lot, especially on YouTube where people are commentating. But tokenization is actually one of the most powerful things that is happening in crypto. And I don't think we will be able to fully appreciate how much it will do until it is pretty much fully integrated. Because tokenization 
is one of those ways that really democratize or potentially democratize investment that previously was not accessible to just your average Joe. Tokenized, tokenized investments make it possible to invest in things that, that previously you would never have been able to invest in, such as luxury real estate for people who have less money than um, multimillionaires do. That gives so much more access potentially, depending on how this will be carried out, for the co-ownership of property, for the ability to, to co-own something and to essentially run it like a business together without needing to, um, to go into the complexities of actually forming a business together. You could be holding a small portion of a self-driving car in the future, which might be moving people around and you might be making an um, appropriate profit from it. Those are the kind of things that until now you had to have your own company or you had to, ha you had to be an investor with millions and millions to, um, to invest to be able to engage in investment tactics like that. And tokenization. Now, not all tokenization means that something gets split up. Obviously not. But that is one of the opportunities that tokenization brings. And that can mean so much potential money flowing into the crypto markets that um, hasn't been there before. If we tokenize a lot of assets, if we make them uh, more easily approachable, um, if we make them uh, available at a lower price point and with lower risks than traditionally, that can really open up the investment market for a lot of people who have so far been excluded. But um, after someone talking about how, how great everything is going, how the future will be great, let's talk about someone who's not as, um, as optimistic. And here we have an investment analyst talking about Bitcoin and its relation to EOS. Corey Miller, a member of the investment team at Blocktower, in his recent tweets revealed his views on how the EOS ecosystem might be operating at a loss, wherein the block producers look forward to turning off operations. There were six tweets in total justifying the standpoint. The Genesis tweet read, Instead of discussing a Bitcoin mining death spiral, perhaps we should be talking about EOS block producers turning off their operations. Although the narrative is that EOS block producers are financially well off, many are currently underwater. He subsequently posted a survey that was filled out by block producers of, of EOS, mentioning the break-even cost at $4 per token. However, Miller pointed out that this figure of the break-even cost looks frail as the cryptocurrency is currently trading at a depreciated price of $1.80. In the next tweet, the blockchain space enthusiast wrote that if the EOS ecosystem does not have a difficulty adjustment mechanism, the block producers will have the obligation to operate at lower cost or shut down at once, in his words. Given there is no difficulty adjustment mechanism in EOS, block producers are going to be forced to either downsize their operations, cut costs, or in some cases completely shut down. Here, Miller admitted that the latter is a greater possibility at this point. In his opinion, approximately 10% of the 81 BPs who will receive the rewards are currently inactive. Furthermore, in an efficient market, people would stop voting for these block producers, but that does not seem to be the case, claimed Miller. As a solution to this situation, the investment expert gave a quick opinion, stating that the problem can only be solved if the price of EOS jumps up again or the BP reward is increased. Now there's a few things I want to talk about here. First up, um, my understanding of the way the EOS blockchain and the um, block producers work is not sufficient to recognize if he is correct here. So I'm gonna state that in the beginning. I just, I just have to assume that his basic math here is correct that generally the break-even point is about $4 and right now with EOS at a lower price, EOS is operating um, at a loss in a similar way that, um, crypto, uh, that Bitcoin mining in many cases is. Now, what I found interesting here is that this, this seems like a, this very much seems like um, a form of whataboutism. Now, if you don't know what whataboutism is, it's, um, it's when you try to divert from a problem on your side by pointing out a similar or a perceived to be similar problem on another side. Say um, you're a politician you accuse, um, you um, support is accused of doing something terrible. Instead of dealing with that terrible thing that um, a politician you support is accused of, you will instead talk about, hey, this other politician has also done bad stuff. And that is, um, and that is a strategy where you divert attention from problems in your camp to perceived problems elsewhere. Sometimes those are legitimately the same problem or even a larger problem, but the point is you are trying to push away responsibility not to act in your own camp. And to me, this seems awfully much like Corey Miller might be a strong Bitcoin supporter who doesn't want the Bitcoin mining death spiral, as it's called, to be discussed as much. 
Now, that is conjuncture, uh, conjunction. I do not know this guy. I have not been exposed to him at all before. <clears throat> but the way this is all phrased seems very interestingly designed to divert attention from most Bitcoin mining right now happening at a loss and a lot of miners actually shutting down to EOS having apparently similar problems. Now, that doesn't mean that these problems in the EOS ecosystem don't need to be addressed. Now, um, like I said, I can't verify if that is correct because I'm not that well versed on the, on the technological level. I don't know if that is really how EOS works. But that would be troubling. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> um, the reason I'm not as worried about EOS is that most of the EOS block producers, from what I know, are companies that have decent funding behind them that should be able to operate for a couple months, even if they're not turning a profit, even at a loss for the actual operation of, um, of the um, block producing, because a lot of them simply have good funding behind them. Now, um, that doesn't necessarily mean all of them do, but um, unlike a lot of mining farms that were opened for, say, Bitcoin, but also for other cryptocurrencies, a lot of those were opened by people who do not have business experience, who do not have sufficient funding behind them and who cannot afford to operate at a loss for a while. And that is why we're seeing why we're seeing some mining farms just completely shut down right now. Because they didn't prepare ahead for the possibility that the Bitcoin price might make mining unprofitable. Um, from what I can tell, in the EOS ecosystem, most block producers, and I could be wrong here, I could be misinformed, I could, I could have gotten biased information, but from what I can tell, that is not as much of an issue in the EOS world. So um, even if it is true that um, currently there are issues there that, um, that block producers have to operate at a loss, even if that is a point, uh, even if that is true, I do not think it is as dangerous for the EOS ecosystem as it is for the uh, Bitcoin ecosystem. And even for the Bitcoin ecosystem, I've been of the opinion that long term, this will not really harm it. I think right now some unprepared companies who didn't who didn't run their companies well, some people some people who started a mining farm but then didn't consider the possibility that they might have to um that the Bitcoin price might go down, which um is idiotic business practice. That is pretty much the only reason anyone would have to shut down their mining operations is because they ran a terrible business. And their business would have been shut shut down at some point anyways. But from what I can tell, that seems more uh, less likely in the EOS space because there's just so much funding going around there. Now, of course, there could also be badly run companies that um, bla badly run block producers that do have to shut down. But um, ultimately, this this bear market, nobody knows for sure how much longer it will continue. But um, I feel pretty secure now that in the next couple of months, especially with all the people moving into the market in early 2019, all the new exchanges that are getting started, all the new services being offered by traditional finance companies. I think we are probably towards the end of this um, of this bear market. We will probably see prices turning around and quickly get to the point where both Bitcoin mining and EOS block producing is definitely profitable again. Um, it might just take a while to get us there. And let's hope that both Bitcoin and for EOS, that the companies involved have planned ahead um, in my opinion, if you started, if you started either a mining firm or a block producer, and you didn't consider the possibility that the token value might decrease so much that um, that it might not be profitable for a while, and you didn't plan ahead, and you didn't run your business in a way that you had um, that you had a nest egg that can take you through a couple of months of that, um, your company probably deserves to shut down. So <laughs> uh, there, there is good business and there is bad business, and. Anyone who has to shut down because of a couple weeks or a couple months of, um, of mining or block producing at a loss was running a terrible business. So we'll see how this turns out. I think in the long run, both Bitcoin and EOS will be perfectly fine. Um, if anyone can educate me on if this logic checks out from this article, if that is true about a block producing having about a $4 per token break even point, and um, obviously the EOS price being lower right now, I would very much appreciate that. But I think even if this is true, this won't be a long-term problem. And this seems very much like an attempt to distract from Bitcoin's issues right now, which to be fair, we do need to bring up any potential issues that EOS has us as well. And um, even as an EOS supporter, if you've watched my channel for a while, you know I um, I point out the negative stuff when I hear about it as well. I'm not, um, I don't ignore the bad stuff. But I don't think this is necessarily a long-term problem. 
Let's talk about Dash. We never talk about Dash because Dash doesn't really do much. But uh, <laughs> uh, in Venezuela, a major fast food, um, a major fast food company is now accepting the Dash token. American fast food chain Shortest Chicken has started accepting payments in cryptocurrency Dash at its locations in Venezuela, according to an official Facebook announcement. According to Dash News, the cryptocurrency is accepted in all 10 restaurant locations in Venezuela. Dash has also completed its first transaction at Church's Chicken and uploaded a video of the event on its official YouTube channel. The restaurant claims to be the first global fast food chain to accept payment in crypto. Now, this might not sound like that much because it is only 10 locations. And um, I have to admit here, I'm not aware of how Church's Chicken is, um, is organized. If this is if the Venezuelan um, version of Church Chicken is set up as a completely separate company, or if it is set up as the um, Venezuelan um, sub, um, not sub company, you know what I mean. If it's if it's a, an official part of the main company, or if it's set up um, separately and just you um, uses the um, trademark and stuff. But um, if this is part of the larger Church Chicken company, this might be a bit of a test one. This might be a test one in Venezuela to potentially start accepting cryptocurrency payments in other countries in the future as well. Now, of course, Venezuela is the obvious choice to begin with this because Venezuela, in Venezuela, crypto is already mainstream. You can pretty much say that. In Venezuela, crypto is mainstream because they have gone through hyperinflation. So a lot of people found refuge in cryptocurrencies and it makes sense that it would be one of the first places where you see a fast food chain accept crypto. Um, but that isn't the whole story here because there was also a case of fake news. The announcement from Church's Chicken follows some confusion regarding the acceptance of Dash at major fast food vendors in Venezuela. On December 7th, PR and media director at Dash News, Mark Mason, posted a tweet stating that KFC Venezuela would start accepting Dash payments the following week. Later, KFC denied the news, stating that processing payments with Dash is not a fact, nor has the publication of any news about it been authorized. So that was a bit of a mess. You had the uh, you had one of the core people behind Dash News just spreading fake news that apparently, apparently he just thought it would be nice if that happened, and he just phrased it like news that shouldn't happen. We see that happen in the crypt in the crypto world a bit too much. That shouldn't happen. But um, ultimately, the core of the story is you can now use Dash to buy yourself some juicy chicken at Church's Chicken in Venezuela. I promise I'm not paid. I've, um, I'm not paid by that company. I've never been to a Church's Chicken. We don't have them here. <laughs> but ultimately, this is one step further to crypto becoming mainstream. And this might lead to more companies within Venezuela or to other international versions of Church's Chicken also accepting cryptocurrencies or to them extending their, um, their services to more different cryptocurrencies. So this is very interesting. This is very promising. And now for a really big case of fake news, because this one, from what I can tell, this one just seems completely made up, but they seem to have gone even farther with, with how, um, how far they went here. In this world of financial uncertainties, one has to wonder how cryptocurrencies and digital assets will pan out in 2019 and beyond. For XRP, it would seem the downtrend is still in place right now, even though there are some interesting gains in the Bitcoin department. For the first time being, the value remains near 30 cents, although the price has dropped just below it in the past few hours. Although there's a solid case to be made for how stable the value of XRP is these days, one also has to acknowledge there's plenty of bearish pressure. Escaping this gravitational pull will be extremely difficult even for this popular digital asset. Even so, it would appear the expectations for XRP are still as high as they have ever been. With so many hopeful souls waiting for a reversal, something will have to give sooner or later. Over the past 24 hours, there has been a 1.8% drop in XRP's US dollar value, bringing the price down to 0.298. On the other side of the medallion, there is a 1.58% uptrend. This latter development is pretty interesting to keep an eye on, primarily because XRP has surpassed the 9000 Satoshi level once again. How long it will remain above that level is a different matter altogether, as there is still plenty of market instability. An interesting squeeze, we actually get to the actual news now after like five, um, five paragraphs. <laughs> An interesting screenshot has surfaced on Twitter, which may or may not be completely fake. Hint, it's almost certainly completely fake. The news article in question confirms World Bank is partnering with Ripple to improve cross-border remittances to Asia. Although there has been somewhat of a correlation between World Bank and Ripple, it would appear things may be shifting into a higher gear moving forward. And I just, I just wanted, let's look at this article. Okay. First of all, 
let's just assume if you were if you wanted to share this big big news story story about the World Bank working with Ripple, and if it was allegedly front page article on this seems to be the Daily Telegraph. This looks like it's on the Daily Telegraph. Wouldn't you be taking a photo of the entire article? That is the very first thing here that um, seems shady. Secondly, this article allegedly from yesterday. Why hasn't it turned up anywhere else? So that is the second definition that makes this almost certainly fake. Then thirdly, if we're looking at the text alignment, this is not good block text. It would an editor would probably go through this, make this a bit prettier. But and then there's the fourth big thing. If you look in here. Whoever wrote this does not have a good grasp of the English language. And this article would never get through an editor at a major um, at a major respected news outlet. Because they, they keep making the same mistakes multiple times. Um, where was one? Uh, oh my god, I just had one. There's a mistake where they keep missing the apost apostrophe in... Um, da -da 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 -da. Sorry, I just have to read this for a moment. Here, the World Bank's relation uh, partnership with Ripple. Notice something there? There's something missing between the K and the S. And this is not the only time they're making really obvious, really simple mistakes in their English like this. This is clearly not a real article. And if it is, this should not have been published in that form. And the way it appeared online um, cropped to not even have the full article cropped where conveniently it's missing the full title of the newspaper. So if someone found, um, if someone opened the December 14th issue of the Daily Telegraph, which this does look like it's supposed to be the Daily Telegraph, and it doesn't have this article in it, people could just claim, oh no, it, it, it's not a Daily Telegraph, it's another newspaper that starts with the Daily T. So um, this is just um, so clearly a fake. And um, I mean, Ultimately, it could turn out to be true, but um, there are so many things pointing towards this being a fake. And um, I mean, in some ways, a good fake, because um, if you just look at it, it does look like a real newspaper. You can see um, you can see something come through from the other side at the back. Um, I'm honestly not quite sure how this was faked, if this was um, completely computer generated or if they actually printed this and then took a photo of it. But um, I mean, it is a reasonably good fake, but there are just some things here that uh, point towards it being fake. Some of those are the issues with the English in the article. Um, also, you would probably capitalize this A from adopt here. Um, but yeah, M so many issues with this that I'm con calling fake. I'm calling fake. But there are some real news as well, and that is how Travala has now integrated XRP as a payments option. Um, Travala is a travel platform where you can book um, flights and uh, I think you can book the flights as well. Uh, you can definitely book hotels there and um, places to stay. And they're now accepting XRP alongside with some other cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, Dash, and um, Binance coin. But um, just, um, it's so sad to me how how wide, how far and wide these almost certainly fake news stories spread before someone takes a proper look at them. Because um, this is supposed to be journalism. And all they're saying here is that it may or may not be fake. Like you just have to take one quick look at it and multiple things that point towards this being fake jump out at you. Like the way to do journalism about this is to say this is likely fake because a b c d but if it turns out to be real we will um, inform you in a separate article um stating this as a might be true might not be true uh, when it looks so very much to be fake i don't think that's good journalism and we've seen this a lot in the crypto world unfortunately um people want to believe things obviously um i mean i would be i would be ecstatic if the world bank was to adopt ripple in some major way and who knows, something like this might happen. But this article? I mean, unless someone finds the newspaper and takes a photo of the actual newspaper of the entire article, of the entire front page. For now, I'm calling bullshit on this because um, if it is a real article, it's a really low quality article of the type you wouldn't expect in something like the Daily Telegraph. And the Daily Telegraph is not, is not the best newspaper out there anyway, but um, you would expect better of them. So I'm, I'm going to call, I'm going to call, excuse my language, bullshit on this. And um, with that, I'm going to let you guys go for today. Um, as always, 
Thanks a lot for watching. I'll be back with another video tomorrow. All these links to these articles you can find in the description to read for yourself. In the description you'll also find links to my social media pages. You can follow me on Facebook or Twitter. As well as ways to support the channel monetarily if you feel so inclined. And if you don't want to or can't support me monetarily, I would really appreciate if you just left a like and comment under this video. It helps so, so, so much. I've noticed since I've asked you guys to leave likes and comments more like more explicitly at the end of a video. I've noticed my videos have been doing so much better on the second day because um, YouTube pushes the videos that have more likes and more comments so much more. I've had, I've been having so many new people found my channel in the last couple days. So um, thank you so much to everyone who leaves likes and comments. And if you're gonna leave one under this video as well, that would be so much appreciated. Thanks for watching and I'll be back at the latest tomorrow.